I want to start by devoting just a few words of introduction and then, uh, and then, uh, and then ask you, of course, to introduce yourself as well as the, uh, the topic of our conversation today. So uh, everyone, welcome. I'm delighted, I'm more than delighted, at the opportunity to introduce uh, my friend Peter Knight, uh, who is our guest today and who will uh, lead our seminar, uh, uh, our faculty seminar uh, in the American, in what do we call ourselves? The Center for the Study of the United States at Tel Aviv University. In, in okay. partnership with the Fulbright program. <laughs> I didn't have, I ran out of breath, so I couldn't possibly finish the whole phrase. Uh, so Peter's our guest today. Um, uh, ironically enough, uh, this, uh, this specific seminar, this specific meeting was scheduled from the very beginning to in fact take place over Zoom. Peter having decided that he would uh, spend the, the year uh, without flying. Uh, 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 since then, of course, we've all joined your principled position in, in, in no longer flying. Uh, and so, uh, in, and so I, uh, we're happy to see you. Um, Peter is, um, uh, I know Peter because uh, quite a few years ago, he organized an extraordinary series of workshops or meetings or conferences, kind of an international uh, 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 um, a project, a, a cross-border project uh, whose real significance was not necessarily crossing international borders, but crossing disciplinary borders in which he gathered people from all sorts of uh, universities and faculties and departments in order to come together and, uh, and discuss uh, uh, questions related to the invention of the market, invention and the ongoing maintenance, in fact, of the market economy. And so there were, there were uh, conferences in, in New York at the New School and at Harvard and at Oxford, all under, in fact, a, a Peter's inspiration and tutelage in, in which he, he took Oxford, an, an active scholarly part, a, a role as well, presenting his own work, which then a, a few years ago it was published in really an extraordinary volume, which I recommend to everyone, entitled Reading the Market Genres of Financial Capitalism in Gilded Age America. A real classic work in American studies itself, such a, it's a richly drawing upon uh, all sorts of uh, traditions and imaginaries. And uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. And that's how I knew Peter. And then I guess we ran into each other about a year ago at the German Historical Institute in Washington, D.C. And I can't, I, I don't really remember what we were doing there. It was something epistemological knowledge Whatever. I, I, I think we were eating muffins. I remember the catering. The catering. I remember, I don't remember the content so much. No, I don't. that's a bad sign. Neither of us remember, in fact, the, the workshop itself. But I do remember a conversation in which you told me that, in fact, you have another life, another life devoted <laughs> to the uh, subject of conspiracy and conspiracies and conspiracy theories. And then we began to talk about how interesting it would be if you would come here and talk to us about that. Uh, little did I know that in addition to reading the market, you had already published on conspiracies in a, a, a volume entitled Conspiracy Nation, if from which Yoav was kind enough to scan and upload the, two, the opening two chapters of the introduction and the first chapter, which we, which we read in anticipation of today's uh, seminar. And then I also saw that you, uh, uh, you, you published another volume specifically devoted to the Kennedy assassination. Uh, okay, I haven't read that yet. I, I presume it's JFK's assassination, even though RFK might be of more interest to an Israeli audience, since, of course, he was purportedly murdered by a Palestinian uh, who recently passed away, if I'm not mistaken, in prison but I might not uh, remember correctly. Anyway, uh, 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 enough about me. Uh, again, welcome, at least virtually. Uh, next time, I, uh, I hope that this will be a face-to-face -face encounter uh, between you and the rest of us. But I hand over the rest of the seminar to your, uh, to your uh, leadership. Thank you, Michael, and, and thank you everyone for, for joining um, us. Um, what I'm going to do is um, just give you an account of um, how I came to this topic, how it all kind of fits together, and um, 
I'll also then give a very quick overview of the, the historiography of conspiracy theories, research from conspiracy theories, and then kind of open up some of the questions that I think uh, having a conspiracy theorist in the White House raises. So I, I, um, I have some pictures, so I'll, if I share my screen, that will make it easier to, for me to talk through some of these things. That's fine. PowerPoint. Start back on. Okay, so um, my, uh, Michael asked me to kind of you know give an intellectual biography, and I realised. Um, uh, you know, my research career has been completely haphazard, completely um, serendipitous. Um, but of course, you know, like all good, cons good conspiracy theorists, I've realized retrospectively that there has been a plan all along, even if I wasn't actually in control of that, uh, that plan of my own career. And what I've come to realize is that what, what I do, and in fact, I need to put this on my business cards, is I'm a vernacular epistemologist or a kind of a scholar of vernacular epistemology. Because you know, one of the problems is, as Michael mentioned, that you know, I work on, I have this kind of split life. I work on conspiracy theories, but also on cultural studies of finance. And what joins the two is this idea of how do ordinary people who, have, who don't have advanced degrees in economics or, or sociology or history, how do they make sense of notions of causality or responsibility, connectedness. And so all along I've been interested in these, these um, kind of grassroots forms of, of theorizing. Um, and I've been struck by the, the kind of apocryphal quote from Saul Lieberman that um, uh, nonsense is nonsense, but the history of nonsense is scholarship. Because you know, all along I've had this struggle of people saying, "Well, what you're working on is just is just nonsense. It's just trash. That's not that's not real proper scholarship." Um, and yet, you know, I feel particularly in in a discipline like American studies, it uh, can become you know the compelling source material for things we need to work on. So, um, I'll talk about conspiracy theory theory. I'll talk uh, give you some idea of how my own work. Um, uh, fits within that and then open up this question of conspiracy theories in the age of Trump. So, um, let me just try uh, sorting out my screen so I can see. No, I have two screens going but both are showing the same thing and that's not working so I've got to use bits of paper instead. So, um, you know, the, you know, when I teach courses on the history of conspiracy theories in the US, uh, or when you read books, it goes, you know, the story goes a bit like this. You know, you talk about um, uh, the, those early fears about witches, or fears about Native Americans, or fears about devils, and then you go on to um, fears about slave revolts. The revolutionary era is just one long kind of conspiracy rant. Uh, you have the Illuminati scares of the, 18, uh, of the 1790s. You have those kind of episodes of nativism from the first decades of the 19th century, anti-Masonism, anti-Catholicism, anti-Mormonism, you know, both sides in the Civil War, uh, the lead up to the Civil War, uh, explaining uh, their position through the logic of conspiracy. Um, then, you know, the story carries on in kind of the late 19th century, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the, kind of the populists, uh, then in the 20th century, the, the Red Scares, the rise of anti-Semitism, and on it goes, Pearl Harbor, McCarthyism, then the assassinations of the 1960s, and then more recently, 9-11, and in our current era, you know, the two, the two classic cases would be Pizzagate and uh, QAnon, more of those later. And then, you know, one of the 
uh, things I've just been reading. Um, there's a short story in uh, uh, The Atlantic uh, this week, imagining the opening of a new branch of the Smithsonian at some point in the 2040s. And it's dedicated to what they call the third great American art form. So after jazz and um, superhero comics, conspiracy theories are the third great American art form. And so, you know, one of the, one of the questions, and this is, you know, a classic question for, for those of us doing American studies is, you know, do, do, does America have a, a natural propensity to believe in conspiracy theories, perhaps more than other nations. And so if you were, you know, if you were to kind of construct arguments around that, you know, there are a bunch of candidates. Uh, some people talk, uh, you know, about the, it's the Puritan heritage, that mindset that is seeking out um, um, kind of typological clues in biblical exegesis. It's a kind of a Manichaean worldview. It's apocalyptic. So these characteristics of thought are there from the various early, uh, earliest Puritan uh, heritage. Or some people argue that um, conspiracy thinking is hardwired into US political culture. Uh, you know, obviously, um, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence, once you get beyond the, the opening paragraph that we all know, you know, the other pages are just one long conspiracy rant. They are, you know, uh, when I, whenever I kind of show this to my students, they've only ever read the first paragraph. They don't realize the rest of it is just, just kind of obsessed with, um, with, uh, with conspiracies. Um, you know, other people have argued that um, it's the nature of the U.S. as a new republic that feels itself um, precarious, that it is kind of under threat from external um, attack or internal infiltration. Uh, but then other, in other cases, um, scholars like Michael Rogan, in effect, have said that the history of the U.S. is the history of um, conspiracy counter-subversive paranoia. Um, you know, you can think all of those episodes of nativism in the 19th century, but uh, the, the kind of repeated red scares of the 20th century. And one of the arguments about the 20th century is that it's uh, a shift from the red fears about the red scare to, to the fed scare, that idea that it's not um, threats, external or internal threats to the American government, but it is the American government, the American way of life itself, that is a conspiratorial threat to, uh, to the citizens. Um, other, other arguments run along the lines of political ideology, that if uh, the country is based on a notion of egalitarianism, then um, anything that smacks of privilege or elite favoritism is seen as a conspiracy, or there's the argument that um, uh, because America is based on a sense of sovereign individualism, that any um, government or societal uh, form of organization is, is a threat to that um, sanctity uh, of the individual. I think, you know, these are all plausible arguments, whether this makes America exceptional in terms of its um, conspiratorial, conspiratorial mindset. I'm not entirely convinced, but that's, um, you know, I think that's one of the big questions that we could consider. Okay, so um, the history of conspiracy theory. I mean, obviously there have always been conspiracies and it's arguable that in, uh, all societies, there have been something that we might recognize as conspiracy theory. There are a couple of interesting books, for example, on conspiracy thinking in ancient Greece and, uh, and Rome. Um, but one of the things that might give us pause for thought is the question of, well, when does the, the very term conspiracy theory, certainly in English, um, come about? And the answer is, uh, uh, well, it's complicated, but basically the term conspiracy theory doesn't um, 
get into the Oxford English Dictionary until the 1990s, uh, early 2000s. So it's, you know, it's a term that it feels like we've known all along, and yet it has a very recent history. So the first, the first uses of the term conspiracy theory that uh, scholars have been able to date, um, you know, using um, kind of the vast um, databases of online newspapers and so on, is um, mentions of conspiracy theory in the 1890s. The idea um, when they were talking about prominent murders, even um, the assassination of President McKinley, there were different theories about deaths. There was the suicide theory or the, um, the kind of, um, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, mob theory or the conspiracy theory. So it wasn't being used in the way that we would understand it now, but that's when the term first get used. You, you kind of see other people, for example, Charles, Charles Beard, writing about accounts of the First World War, criticizing those accounts um, for putting forward what he called the devil theory of war. And that in some ways is closer to what we would understand as a kind of the pejorative understanding of conspiracy theory, a, a way of categorizing other people's understandings of history that you don't necessarily agree with. But the first actual recognizable use of the term conspiracy theory comes from Karl Popper writing in um, the 1940s and he puts forward this idea of what he calls the conspiracy theory of society and by that he uh, in effect is talking about um, it's an attack on people who fail to understand the, the logic of the social sciences, the idea that history unfolds through the complex interaction of social and economic forces rather than the individual intentions of powerful plotting individuals behind the scenes. Um, one of the things about Popper, I think, that is often forgotten when people are reconstructing this history of conspiracy theory as a term is that I, th I think kind of Popper in effect is, was very much writing in the context of the kind of Mon, Mon Pelerin society, early formulations of neoliberalism, this idea that um, uh, uh, Popper's real complaint about conspiracy theory is that it failed to understand that there are always unintended consequences of intentional actions. So conspiracies never can go as planned, therefore anyone who believes in one of those is daft. And that to me smacks of that kind of attack on um, um, the notion of central planning you know, that kind of neoliberal sense that um, the problem with Stalinist um, uh, Soviet Union is the belief in central planning, central planning never works, there are always unintended consequences. And I think in effect, Popper is seeing conspiracy theory as an extension of that idea. But we can also recognize other uh, scholars at the same time, for example, Theodore, Theodore Adorno and others at the Frankfurt School who are trying to, un who are trying to explain um, um, the Holocaust, the rise of totalitarianism. They're trying to understand the mass psychology of fascism or the authoritarian personality, uh, as Adorno said. You then get the consensus historians in the US in the 50s and 60s who, rather than trying to explain the rise of European fascism between the wars, are trying to explain the uh, incipient dangers of totalitarianism within the US. So the rise of McCarthyism in particular is um, uh, what they're trying to explain. And uh, the kind of most prominent voice of this is the historian Richard Hofstadter, whose article, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, is still the go-to article that all journalists routine, routinely, in fact, kind of religiously quote every single um, uh, article I've ever read, always begins with Hofstadter. Um, and Hofstadter's article is still genuinely powerful uh, uh, and important. And in effect, what he was suggesting is that there is a recurrent strand through uh, American history of um, a kind of a paranoid style that is Manichaean, apocalyptic, that 
endlessly sees conspiracies where there are none. And Hofstadter, in effect, was writing, I think, in the context of not just um, a kind of uh, uh, McCarthyism when he first started thinking about these, but I think more particularly the rise of Goldwater in the, in, in the, the early 60s, that sense of a, a fear of a return of a, of a kind of anti-intellectual populism. And so Hofstadter is seeing conspiracy theories, although he never actually calls them conspiracy theories, he calls it the paranoid style. He sees this as, as the kind of thin end of the wedge. And yet, at the same time, he is suggesting the conspiracy theories or the paranoid style is a, is a minority um, phenomenon that is confined to those who fail to understand the glories of the American uh, political system of pluralism, those who fail to understand the, the give and take of compromise. So Hofstadter's work is really influential. Um, it went on, you know, other scholars like Bernard Balin then did the kind of thorough study of uh, the American Revolution as one long series of um, uh, paranoid um, exclamations, or the work of David Brian Davis, thinking about some of the nativist movements, but also the slave power uh, movements of the um, mid 19th century. They then get challenged um, by Gordon Wood in an important article from 1982. And, and Wood argues that um, Hofstadter's notion of the paranoid style makes no sense because in effect you're calling the, the revolutionary leaders, you know, George Washington, paranoid, even though Hofstadter is careful to say that he doesn't mean the term clinically, it's just kind of a form of cultural paranoia, uh, would, along you know, with other people, worry, well, well, what sense does it make to call you know, some of the finest intellectuals of their day um, paranoid. And so Wood says that um, actually understanding the world as a conspiracy, as the product of human intentionality, was a sophisticated enlightenment style of thought that sees a relationship between cause and effect in kind of a Newtonian way, rather than ascribing everything to providence. So Wood says that those thinkers uh, of the 18th century and through to the early 19th century were actually uh, demonstrating sophisticated forms of thought by understanding causality and deceit through the lens of conspiracy. But with the rise of the social sciences in the 19th century, he says that actually uh, anyone after that who believes in conspiracy theories is indeed paranoid, uh, foolish, unsophisticated in the way that Hofstadter described. So um, my own work, uh, along with a bunch of other cultural studies scholars working in the late 90s, early 2000s, some might say it was a coincidence that we were all writing our PhDs at exactly the same time. But obviously, um, there was some secret communication channel that made our ideas all fall into kind of perfect alignment. And in effect, we all um, started from the position that, um, you know, Hofstadter's mistake was to pathologize conspiracy theories. In fact, I think, you know, the mistake goes further that in effect, what, um, what he was putting forward was a descriptive argument rather than an analytical one. Because in fact, he was saying, you know, um, conspiracy theories, we can explain by um, seeing them as a form of paranoia. And then you ask the question, so what exactly is paranoia? And the answer is, well, paranoia is the propensity to believe in conspiracy theories. And sort of round in this circle you go with, where you feel like you haven't actually explained anything at all. So in terms of, in kind of descriptive terms, and with its emphasis on style, I think there's still a lot of value in Hofstadter. But in terms of that kind of analytical understanding of conspiracy theories as a form of kind of marginalized or pathologized um, uh, uh, understanding of the world, to me, it's never made that much sense. What I think we can recognize, though, um, 
that uh, Hofstadter and the other historians writing in the kind of 50s and 60s do, in effect is to delegitimize conspiracy theory as a way of understanding the world. This is where the term, the very idea of conspiracy theory comes into kind of public consciousness. And obviously it's coming into public consciousness uh, as, as, a sign of, uh, as a sign of worry. In effect, I, you know, my argument would be that, that Hofstadter is paranoid about the possibility of mass paranoia, mass hysteria. And so the very idea of conspiracy theory is not a neutral, objective term like feminism or um, communism or some otherism. It is a pejorative term, and Hofstadter is up front. He says, you know, I mean the term pejoratively because it is a way of characterizing a certain style of thought that you find beyond the pale of, um, uh, of kind of rational political exchange. So my own work um, fed into that series of debates um, challenging Hofstadter, but because you know I come from a background of literary and cultural studies, um, I focused on the idea of you know the question of why is it that so many prominent American writers and artists and filmmakers were uh, fascinated by the narrative of conspiracy. Why did they return to that narrative form again and again in the kind of works of the 60s and 70s and after? So, you know, writers like Thomas Pynchon, Don DeLillo, Margaret Atwood, Joan Didion, um, William Burroughs, Philip K. Dick, Ken Kesey, Ishmael Reed, Joseph Heller, and on and on it goes. But also it wasn't just the writers, it was that popular sociological works like um, uh, Reisman and White and, you know, that, that kind of sociological anxiety about the man in the gray flannel suit, that fear of, fear of kind of corporate um, um, encroachment on sovereign masculinity. Okay. So one of the arguments that um, um, I was putting forward and these other scholars were putting forward was the idea that the way that the kind of the, the imagination, the representation of what counts as a conspiracy began to change in these works of American literature and culture of the, the 60s and 70s. And I think Don DeLillo's novel Libra from the early 80s about the Kennedy assassination kind of captures that. You know, he says, if we are on the outside, we assume a conspiracy is the perfect working of a scheme, silent, nameless men with unadorned hearts. A conspiracy is everything that ordinary life is not. It's the inside game, cold, sure, undistracted, forever closed off to us. All conspiracies are the same taut story of men who find coherence in some criminal act. And so that's, you know, the traditional notion of a conspiracy uh, that animates a conspiracy theory. It's this, it's this kind of imagination of some, some kind of taut, knit, uh, tight knit group of ruthless um, uh, agents who are pulling the, the, the strings of history. But increasingly, um, I think what happens in these works of the 60s and 70s is that the conspiracy becomes represented as a vast impersonal system. It's the idea that um, uh, the, you know, if you think about um, something like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or um, um, uh, the, uh, Catch-22, the military industrial complex or the Combine or something like um, the Stepford Wives by Ira Levin. It's a focus on institutions such as corporations or the government or uh, knowledge systems, social networks, even perhaps the idea of patriarchy itself, you know, in the works of uh, someone like uh, Betty Friedan. 
And so there's the, what you get is this idea of agency panic, a sense that um, there's an obs obsessive sense of individual sovereign sovereignty being eroded by large organizations, systems, and structures. And I think what's going on in these works is what they're really trying to do is understand social conditioning. Um, but they're understanding social conditioning as if it were a deliberate plot. So in effect, my reading is that conspiracy theory is a form of pop sociology. Um, or, if you like, conspiracy theory provides or is trying to provide an understanding of ideology in a country that is constitutionally incapable of understanding what uh, I would understand by uh, uh, ideology. And it's also that kind of sense that you are somehow the one person who has managed to escape this, this conditioning. That's the fantasy that's played out again and again. And so in a case like um, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, it's presenting patriarchy as if it were the result of a deliberate conspiracy. And again and again, these writers dramatized what we might now call institutional sexism or institutional racism as if they were a conspiracy. Other ways in which the imagination and the representation of conspiracy began to change. One of them is the idea that um, um, there's a shift from representing conspiracy as a form of hierarchical control with uh, the evil plotters at the top of the, the pyramid um, uh, in charge of everything. And increasingly, I think what we get instead is a notion of conspiracy as a network. Conspiracy emerges not kind of through um, the basic Illuminati pyramid structure, as this handy illustration um, uh, shows, um, with you and I, the common people at the bottom of the pyramid, oppressed by the uh, Satan, fallen angels, powers and principalities at the top, only just above the Rothschilds and uh, the Rockefellers, and so the pyramid of power goes. Increasingly, I think conspiracy is represented like, like this, this kind of tangled diagram or what, you know, um, you know those, uh, the, the favoured illustration in Hollywood movies of the, the, red, the red string on the pin board, what's called the crazy wall in Hollywood speak. That's the way conspiracy is now increasingly imagined. Not a hierarchy, but a, but a network. And if ever I write a new book on conspiracy theories, this, this is gonna be the cover. This is all I've ever wanted to say uh, about conspiracy theories. And what I think is going on in some of this uh, American culture of the 60s and 70s, or even right through to the present, is often kind of there is a self-reflexive um, focus on, on epistemology, a sense that if skepticism is taken to its logical extreme, which increasingly seems to happen with conspiracy theories, then you end up in this kind of vertigo of um, suspicion. You, you suspect everything uh, in that kind of Cartesian way, including your own thoughts. And you end up in this position where um, everything becomes um, uh, sus uh, 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 under suspicion, even the very uh, idea of reality itself, even the very possibility of truth. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. So, um, in effect, the argument uh, of that earlier work of mine was that um, conspiracy theories increasingly began to imagine structure as agency. Or what they were doing was producing these transformative metaphors that allowed an understanding of both structure and agency at the same time. Seeing, kind of um, allowing us to name names and think in terms of individual blame and responsibility, yet at the same time, imagining these abstract, impersonal social forces as if they were individuals. 
the other argument that uh, was running through that book is an argument that um, um, Frederick Jameson um, uh, famously called uh, uh, identified in the argument in cognitive mapping. And we said that conspiracy theories are the poor person's cognitive mapping of the postmodern age. It's a degraded figure of the total logic of late capital, a desperate attempt to represent the latter system whose failure is marked by its slippage into sheer theme and content. This idea that, um, in effect, a lot of contemporary conspiracy theories are allegories, uh, albeit distorted allegories, of global capitalism, that that's what's really going on in a lot of this um, conspiracy culture. So, um, I then abandoned working on conspiracy theories for, um, for at least a decade, thinking I had said everything that then needed to be said, and other people had written actually better versions of the book I, uh, I wrote, and it felt like, you know, there was nothing new to say. But then, um, uh, Trump. Uh, well, there were actually kind of other personal reasons why I turned to return to conspiracy theories. But you know, intellectually, there were there were kind of three three kind of things that I was trying to make sense of. Um, the first was that other disciplines had latched onto conspiracy theories. Um, so the psychologists and the political scientists had all suddenly encountered conspiracy theories as a problem that they were trying to understand. And yet I felt kind of, you know, immense frustration with a lot of that work. Clever, though it is amazingly clever, though some of those social psychology experiments are. My problem with it was that they always seem to assume that conspiracy theories are an anthropological constant, the same in all societies and cultures. And yet, most of the work that I'd been doing or most of the work that I had admired from other people was trying to understand what it was about particular historical moments or particular cultures or particular kind of media regimes, political regimes that produced distinctive forms of conspiracy culture. So that was the first thing, a sense of, okay, there's actually something kind of uh, at stake here in disciplinary terms. Uh, what is it the cultural studies can explain um, that maybe the psychologists and the political scientists are failing to grasp? The second question is the one that um, new research that I'm doing now is engaged with, and that's the idea of what difference has the internet made? You know, I was writing in a pre-internet era. I was having to go to kind of uh, out-of-the-way bookshops to buy all of these kind of weird books and pamphlets, and now it's just it's just all there. Uh, at your fingertips. So that's, uh, I've been kind of starting new projects on, on that. And then the third question uh, is this question, what difference does it make when you have a conspiracy theorist in, in the White House? Um, but that uh, is, is slightly more complicated than it might at first seem. And the argument goes a bit like this. Um, um, the, the, the challenge is, uh, a more general challenge to forms of postmodern theory that would come about um, uh, with the way that the alt right, in particular, has adopted a lot of the the kind of intellectual um, posturing or the intellectual shorthand of postmodern theory. So there seems to be no distinction between kind of, you know, what's real and what's not real. There are no ultimate foundational truths. The alt-right has embraced what looks to me or what looked to me in the past like postmodern theory and, and is therefore kind of um, uh, presented this real challenge. And the challenge has, has come up in different ways. For example, in literary and cultural studies, um, someone like Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick um, uh, attacked what she identified as paranoid reading, this idea of always uh, trying to find the kind of, you know, the hidden uh, violence beneath surface appearances. And instead, people have been arguing that we need to think in terms more of surface reading rather than paranoid reading. Um, and more generally, you know, there's been a, a kind of uh, a rethinking of the foundational idea of the hermeneutic of suspicion. And someone like Bruno Latour, I think, um, was 
was putting it kind of most interestingly, uh, actually got me 15 years ago. Um, and this is Bruno Latour thinking about um, the fact that, you know, his, his neighbors in rural Burgundy and France were um, spouting off about 9-11 conspiracy theories in ways that he found kind of really mystifying and troubling precisely because it seemed like they were engaging in what he would identify as critique. So in this, uh, this kind of famous article, why has critique run out of steam? He said, maybe I'm taking conspiracy theories too seriously, but it worries me to detect in those mad mixtures of knee jerk disbelief, punctilious demands for proofs and free use of powerful explanation from the social Neverland, many of the weapons of social critique. Of course, conspiracy theories are, are an absurd deformation of our own arguments, but like weapon, weapons smuggled through a fuzzy border to the wrong party, these are our weapons nonetheless. So I think, you know, this is part of this kind of larger anxiety that um, politically progressive forms of critique have run out of steam precisely because conspiracy theories uh, and especially in the alt-right versions that seem to be everywhere now, have adopted that language of unmasking reality, finding the underlying causes beneath surface appearances. So within this context, then, um, you've got the work of... Um, uh, Rosenblum and Muirhead, the book uh, a lot of people are saying, which was the uh, piece of uh, writing uh, I sent round. And they're trying to argue that there's something different about conspiracy theories now in the age of Trump. Their argument is that conspiracy theories now work through assertion rather than explanation. They require assent merely by kind of sharing and liking on Twitter rather than some active involvement. They rely on a kind of a populist understanding of, uh, of the people um, versus the elites. And more than anything, their argument is that the new conspiracism works um, to provoke disorientation, the idea that um, conspiracy theories undermine um, any sense of being able to determine what's true or false, what's objective and what's not. And they're doing that through this kind of process of delegitimation of the very kind of social structures and forms of um, both institutional and intellectual forms of reason and argument and objectivity and expertise that... Um, 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 structure any civilized society. And so they're arguing that can, uh, this new form of conspiracism is particularly uh, troubling. Okay, so I will leave it there. And so some of the questions I've raised are, you know, the question of does the US have a special affinity for conspiracy theories? Um, one question I haven't raised, but it's one that often uh, comes up in discussion, are conspiracy theories more of the right than the left? Does that make any sense anymore in this kind of new configuration? And are conspiracy theories now on the rise? Is there something kind of different and particularly troubling about what um, Rosenblum and Muirhead call the new conspiracism? And obviously the real question that we all need to know and ask ourselves is just who is Q? Okay, thanks very much. I will uh go back to this view now Michael, yo. okay i've unmuted myself i encourage everyone else to do it likewise and to uh, and and as we start engaging with uh, all these materials and uh, ideas and readings uh, that Peter's presented to us. So the floor's open, or the screen's open, however, whatever metaphor we 
prefer. And um, I'm happy to take kind of real hands, kind of proper Zoom hands or kind of things in the chat box, um, whatever, whatever you're used to. I can't actually see most of you. So obviously kind of, you know, um, you type, type, type your questions or kind of do the, the waving hand thingy, Bob. <clears throat> and Michael, if you can help me kind of moderate the, uh, the discussion. Oh, I, I'll, I, whatever help you'll need, although I'm not <laughs> sure you'll need my help. Um, let's just wait a minute or two as we make sense. <laughs> uh, and we think about who Q might be. Yeah, I can jump in uh, uh, for lack of anyone else uh, in this early, uh, early part of uh, the conversation. Uh, I have all sorts of questions and all sorts of comments. And I'll begin with a very general comment uh, or observation. I'd be very interested in to hear what you have to say in response. Uh, uh, and that is that a, 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 I latch on to a, a, a one comment you made in which you suggested to us, in fact, that conspiracy theories are, in fact, a search for coherence. It was a term, in fact, that you used, that uh, a, 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 a conscious and a, a deliberate and, a, in fact, a, a deeply invested a effort to make sense of events a, in our world and a, a, to accord them structure. Here's some other terms that you used uh, alongside coherence, search for coherence, an attempt to accord uh, event structure and agency, blame, responsibility, and all the, kind of, all the basic uh, categories of rational and reasonable thought. So in, in that respect, I almost want to suggest, or I almost come to the conclusion, that at least in the dialectic fashion, the conspiracy theories are very much uh, are very very much belong to a to an empiric our critical uh, uh, again uh, 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 in in the tour's terms our own critical our own critical uh, um, our own critical lexicon of uh, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, using uh, empirical observation in which to make rational sense or reasonable sense uh, of, what, uh, of what's going on. And what's going on is increasingly complicated. And that brings me to actually one of my uh, points of dissatisfaction with the Muirhead and Rosenblum texts that you sent around uh, uh, before, uh, beforehand. And that is their, uh, their approach to this uh, very important rubric, very important concept, very important um, experience of common sense, because what they uh, uh, do um, is uh, want to suggest that conspiracy theories are, in, are an in insult to common sense. That's their term, an insult to common sense. Uh, in, in that respect, common sense in their terms almost becomes this kind of floating signifier, a kind of transcendent, self-evident a category divorced completely from any social context. But when I think about conspiracy theories, and I can think about conspiracy theories as a, as a, a desperate response to an ever more complex social reality, then I almost come to the opposite conclusion than what Muirhead and Rosenblum uh, present us. And that is the conspiracy theories don't seem to be an insult to common sense. They seem, in fact, to reflect the actual breakdown of common sense, if not the breakdown of the common and of commonality and of community. Uh, I don't know if we want to call that a right wing or a left wing uh, protest, it, uh, uh, particularly against the effects of uh, neoliberal capitalism or, 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 or the uh, 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 global... Uh, uh, the abstractions of globalization. But in that respect, these texts actually seek to pathologize people who in fact might be responding to the breakdown in the basic social, communal, uh, personal fabrics of their own lives. Which leads me, again, they talk about, uh, 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 they talk about conspiracy theories as delegitimating democracy. And I almost reach the opposite conclusion that conspiracy theories in fact might be an expression or response to the delegitimation of democracy. 
That is, democracy is already failing or failing increasingly large segments of the public, of the population, that then in response latch onto a desperate attempt to explain matters in ways that, uh, in ways that reflect, in fact, uh, their own loss of faith in, in the in political orthodoxies and in business as usual. So uh, I don't know uh, how coherent I've been in addressing the inner coherence of, inf of cons conspiratorial thought, but that, that's my kind of, that's my uh, uh, most general re reaction to the th uh, uh, all these questions and themes that you've raised. So um, um, the answer is yes. That's what I thought. It's, it's I'm almost glad you as agree if, with me. I'm glad you agree with me. It's almost as if you'd read my book, Michael. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's all there. So the, um, you know, that's, that's the kind of, those are the kinds of arguments that I have been trying to make about conspiracy theories all along. And, you know, other people made them in, in slightly different, perhaps even more extreme ways. A, a friend of mine, you know, argued about um, you know, conspiracy theories are the, the, e the evil twin of rationality or of legitimate knowledge, and that legitimate knowledge is always having to assert its, um, its centrality and its authority precisely by demarcating out some forms of thought as illegitimate as being kind of beyond the pale of rationality. And so, you know, uh, uh, other people put, put forward the argument in even more extreme ways and said that, you know, uh, the thing about conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories are not the problem. It's conspiracy theory panic that's the problem. It's the kind of, it's the panicked reaction of the intelligentsia about the possibility that the masses are being kind of sucked down into this, uh, into the rabbit hole of, of irrationality. So the, um, the, the way that I've always tried to see conspiracy theories is, is as a, you know, is as a, uh, as a response, not necessarily correct at the factual level, but as a kind of powerful and meaningful response to the conditions of uh, the society that we're living in. And the things that they latch, the conspiracy theories latch onto are often unavailable in ordinary discourse in other ways. That maybe, you know, yes, uh, obviously at the level of kind of literal truth, a lot of conspiracy theories are not necessarily entirely true, but um, read, Allegor allegorically or as a, uh, uh, as, a uh, as a kind of you know um, as an embodiment of an understanding of these uh, you know the, the, the failures of uh, the enlightenment project uh, and the failures of um, um, particularly US society to deliver what it is promised in terms of equality and justice. And to me, conspiracy theories make a lot of sense. I mean, William Burroughs famously said that um, the paranoid is the person in possession of all the facts. And, and you know, one of the other things about conspiracy theories is that they, um, there's an obsessive rationalization going on, that they are aping all of the, um, the, the forms of scholarly discourse. I mean, Hofstadter himself complains about the way conspiracy theory books have an obsessive number of footnotes. You know, the, there is kind of an obsession with, with pedantry um, uh, in a kind of, you know, as an homage to, to, to proper scholarly work. And yet the kind of, you know, most scholars are always trying to say, but, but what they're doing is not real scholarship. Um, and I've been interested in that kind of sense. Well, so where does that anxiety come from that, um, that there are, you know, there are legitimate and illegit illegitimate forms of critique or whether, what are the, although, you know, I've never followed Hofstadter psychologizing conspiracy theorists, 
I'm interested in a sense the, in the, the psychic investments of why people believe in these kinds of stories. And so um, one way of thinking about the psychic investment of conspiracy thinking is to, to ask yourselves, you know, do people, do conspiracy theorists really want the ultimate revelation? Or do they at the same time want to be chasing the ultimate revelation, but want that chase to be perpetually um, uh, deferred? And so, you know, I think we can think of, uh, in terms of those kind of psychic investments like that, but also politically, what is it that um, these conspiracy theories are really saying? So yes, so back to your, back to your, your question, Michael. Yes, I agree. It's almost like political theater or a form of radical agitprop in where the conspiracy theories perform as parodies of the knowledge uh, of uh, the knowledge community, of our monopoly over knowledge and the use by authorities. I mean, here again, Muirhead and Rosenblum use this term, the authority of knowledge is under siege or in crisis while ignoring the fact that the authorities always use knowledge in order to, in fact, enforce their authority uh, uh, and discipline the population uh, uh, in general, which, of course, is something we've uh, uh, most spectacularly and intensely uh, experienced the past few months with this corona siege. Uh, uh, so it's, it's funny. It's, it brings me to, the popul to populism, which, of course, was another... Um, um, object of Hofstad, Richard Hofstadter's uh, um, um, arrogance, we could say, uh, and certainly conscious attack as uh, uh, finding an American uh, fascism a form of proto uh, American populism a form of proto fascism, writing, of course, after the Second World War about the 1890s. And, uh, and in that respect, uh, um, uh, the populists were most definitely, uh, not that most definitely, but uh, arguably the most important uh, uh, um, uh, stage, the most important political revolt uh, in the course of uh, American history. And so, uh, so, yes, perhaps we should think about conspiracy theory as a form of radical politics. I guess that's what I'm trying to get around to saying in response to your response. Yeah, and the, you know, this was Michael Rogan's beef with Hofstadter, Rogan writing, you know, in the, the 60s and 70s coming out of the new left, thinking that how can you dismiss populism of the 1890s as merely irrational, emotional, anti-Semitic nonsense. Yes, it was that, but it was also um, a form of, you know, legitimate political dissent against the rise of uh, industrial capitalism. And so that's, you know, that's where the political fault lines uh, began to emerge in the historiography on conspiracy theory with the psycho historians like Hofstadter, who had been, you know, of the left in the the third, like many intellectuals, turn towards the uh, kind of the centre and the right in the uh, the fifties and sixties, and so necessarily was trying to see everything of um, you know the the dangers of. Uh, kind of mass um, political hysteria. And, um, and yet, you know, kind of uh, historians writing after that kind of felt like, well, it makes no sense. And this is, this is, you know, this is where the, you know, the term conspiracy theory becomes, you know, the, the fault line for challenges, because some people say, look, the very idea of conspiracy theory is, is a, uh, calling something a conspiracy theory is, is an insult. It's basically saying, I don't agree with, with your view, and it's not actually doing any, any, analytical, uh, any an analytical work. More extreme than that, other people have kind of suggested that actually we need to distinguish between bad conspiracy theories and good theories of conspiracy. 
and you kind of get all and kind of people get tangled into knots of trying to um, uh, kind of separate out the good ways of understanding connectedness and plotting behind the scenes and the illegitimate forms. And um, just, to, just kind of seeing in the chat, um, Taylor Johnston is asking, what responsibility do those of us who still have faith in critique hold with regard to the ongoing relationship between critique and conspiracy? And, you know, I think, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the challenge that Rosenblum and Muirhead pose. You know, well, if you think the conspiracy theories uh, and conspiracy theorists are dangerous and wrong, what do you, what's your responsibility as an academic? Do you, do you have to call out conspiracy theories whenever you see it? And, you know, certainly this is a problem that I've, I've had a lot because the view that I've been describing to you today and that Michael's been elaborating, I'm happy in kind of an audience like this, uh, you know, to explain how I come to this conclusion. But when I'm doing um, TV and radio, what conspiracy theorists hear and what the general public hear is, ah, so you believe in all of this stuff, do you? And so I, in the past, you know, I've, uh, where other colleagues of mine who write on conspiracy theories get endless emails attacking them of, you're, you're wrong about 9-11, you're, you know, you're wrong about QAnon. I get the email saying, ah, oh, thank goodness, someone from, from, from academia is taking our side, is, is heroically uh, supporting us. And so, you know, I, you know, I, I, I had this endless problem of, well, you know, what's, what's the responsibility? I mean, and I think, you know, although I, you know, I, I would agree with, what a lot, with a lot of what you were saying, Michael, but, but how do you then address the fact that um, a lot of conspiracy theories, um, for example, and I'm going to raise it, but I'm, we won't necessarily immediately, for example, you know, what do you do when there is conspiracy-minded misinformation circulating out there? Okay, let's see if other people have their, their uh, couple questions. Hi, Peter. Hi there. Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, how can we debunk uh, uh, conspiracy theories? Or should we try to debunk them? Or should we just ignore them? Because QAnon is amazing. I mean, how can you debunk that there is uh, this, this, this person is exist? Okay, so the um, I've been I've been doing a lot of media interviews on this very question recently because it's it's the thing everyone wants to know. You know, we've got a problem out there. You're the you're the expert on conspiracy theories. Tell us what to do. And obviously, you know, I can't go into some kind of long diatribe about Bruno Latour. That's that's not going to work. And so, you know, there are I think there are kind of you know a couple of important things to remember. The first for me is to recognize that conspiracy theories are not just a set of um, propositions. So arguing fact by fact against conspiracy theorists is not gonna work, not, not because they're right or in factual terms, but because conspiracy theory needs to be understood more, uh, more like a religion than um, a set of kind of, you know, um, individual propositions. And so if you take something like QAnon, yes, there are, you can extract out of it a set of propositions that um, there is a, you know, there is a deep state plot to undermine Trump and there is gonna be a coming storm of a, uh, a, a, of, a, of a second civil war and you can kind of tease out something vaguely resembling a set of, propositions. But QAnon is basically the third great awakening or the second second great awakening. It is, it is, it is rapidly becoming um, an all-encompassing worldview that people um, ascribe to in the same way that they do religion. Yes, there are a set of propositional beliefs, but 
what those beliefs are, are giving you is a sense of identity, a sense of community. And so if you challenge conspiracy theorists point by point, you're never going to win. Firstly, because the tedious arguments will go on forever. Their patience <laughs> is uh, uh, greater than mine. But because in effect, what you're doing is challenging their sense of identity rather than challenging uh, their, their beliefs. It's not that they can drop particular beliefs and still remain um, the person that they feel that they are. And so for kind of, you know, diehard conspiracy theorists, it can be incredibly hard um, and fruitless uh, to argue against them. But, and this is another of my problems with the, the social scientists, um, the psychologists and the political scientists working on this, they, you know, they work by opinion polls. We're drowning in alarmist opinion polls about conspiracy theorists. You know, 30% um, of Americans believe that um, uh, the coronavirus was, was um, created in a lab. 50% of Americans think that it's, um, you know, the threat is being exaggerated. You go on and, and, the, and the, you know, the opinion polls are meant to kind of, meant to kind of make us worried that, oh my God, you know, this level of belief is, is just kind of uh, horrifying and dangerous. Um, and yet, I think a lot of people, when they're asked a question, and certainly I do this when I get asked questions in opinion polls, you sort of say, it might be true. How do I know? I haven't kind of looked into the facts. I suspect that, you know, the authorities are a bunch of kind of lying bastards. And I imagine that that's the kind of thing that they would do, even if they haven't done so in this case. And so often you get the idea that it's as if there were a conspiracy or rather, and this is, you know, this, this was the point I was making about institutional racism and institutional sexism. We know as kind of sensible scholars that there is no kind of secret men's club behind the world uh, as the Stepford Wives imagines plotting patriarchy. And yet the world that we've ended up with, or, you know, institutional racism makes the same argument, the world we've ended up with may as well have been plotted by a conspiracy. It couldn't have been any worse than the, you know, <laughs> someone had actually um, planned to bring it about. But knowing that, so if you know that actually, you know, you feel like the world is as it is, you know, uh, how else can you explain it? And so I think that that's often what's happening with those opinion polls. It's that sense of, well, you know, I don't know why things are as bad as they are. I am, it's entirely plausible that someone somewhere might have been planning it. And there is that kind of, that kind of weird comfort in the sense of what would you prefer? Entire randomness, the kind of Homer Simpson philosophy that shit happens, or would you prefer the kind of idea that actually it is all planned and controlled? It's just by the kind of the wrong people. And so if we can kind of wrest control of the levers of power from uh, the evil cabal, then utopia will be um, uh, just around the corner for us. Yeah, I think it's, this is the dangerous thing that it's not only the die house conspiracy theories, it's also like the, the silent majority that like you said, I don't know, maybe it sounds about it. I won't be surprised if it's so. And so this is like the dangerous thing, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's, that basic, it's that basic problem of how do we explain complex systems? Yeah. yeah. Um, how do we explain emergent properties um, uh, such as the ecosystem, consciousness, the economy? culture, all of these are kind of complex emergent systems that um, uh, look as if someone had planned it. You know, the idea of intelligent design. How could something as complex as the human eye exist if there was not uh, a god who had kind of engineered uh, with amazing um, foresight um, uh, the complexity of the human eye? And yet, 
obviously evolution suggests a few kind of basic rules and principles of uh, evolution and several billion years of history can end up with something that looks and smells like intelligent design. Yeah. And so, in effect, you know, the, the kind of the, the phrase that I've been using in the last couple of years is the idea of conspiracy without conspirators. You know, and I think that this is, uh, in effect, uh, what someone like kind of Michel Foucault was talking about, um, or a lot of kind of post structuralist theory is talking about how can you have these forms of uh, complex organization and, you know, indeed, uh, forms of social deformation, uh, social problems that look, you know, as if they were planned, and yet um, there are no conspirators behind the scenes. And that's, you know, that's, that's the challenge of history, that's the challenge of sociology, and I think that that's the challenge for ordinary citizens, which is why I've been interested in these uh, questions of vernacular epistemology. You know, what do you do if you don't read Bruno Latour and have actor network theory? You know, you tell stories. And, yeah. you know, the stories that our culture tells, um, both kind of in non-fiction terms, but also fictional uh, stories, these are the ways that we try and make sense of, of these kind of, you know, really profound um, uh, issues. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, I was just wondering if you could um, tell me where you would categorize or where on the scale um, would you place a film like Eva DuVernay's 13th, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a narrative, if you will, of uh, American racial institutionalism, you know, in this, until, you know, through the Clinton era until, you know, mass incarceration. Um, is, you know, I feel like the ground that I'm standing on has become rather unsettled. So uh, if you could, you know, walk me through your thoughts on this, this film and, and is it a document? So conspiracy yeah, so I, I i haven't i haven't seen the film so can can you walk me through it i'm just uh, curious to see how you t t tell me about it and tell tell me how you you um, interpret it well it's a film by an african-american female uh, uh producer and director and uh she basically gives a kind of narrative that you know once slavery was over we had you know jim crow and when jim crow was over with the uh civil rights then um, you know, a new legislation uh, came in, actually a lot of it during the, the Clinton era, uh, you know, obviously beginning before that, but to, you know, curtail the freedoms of uh, African Americans and to give them harsher punishments, longer jail sentences, you know, which caused what is now called in the U.S. the new um, uh, Jim Crow which is this mass incarceration and she really shows through, you know, what you were saying, this kind of documenting, uh, you know, all kinds of government um, decisions and use of all kinds of, you know, um, whether it's privatization of the jails or whether it's the, uh, you know, using um, some kind of like an, I can't, an outsider poll to help uh, raise questions of legislation. You know, so it, there's some, it's, the way it's told, it seems to me as a, some kind of systematic, um, you know, kind of deliberate, as you were saying, uh, racial institutionalism. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. and then I feel That's... like, wow, you know, so I'm, I'm part of the, you know, I'm part of the people and the conspiracy on, on, on that, on, you know, on the left wing side of conspiracy, you know, and, and rather than, you know, but it's, it's kind of the same. What yeah, that do. sounds um, that sounds a really uh, fascinating film that I I need to see. So I, um, in that that book, conspiracy culture, uh, I wrote a chapter on um, African American conspiracy theories, and it was uh, in many ways a response to um, there was there was kind of a lot of talk in the late nineties about so called black paranoia. So you had these kind of right wing. Um, 
writers like uh, Dinesh D'Souza saying, you know, the problem with African Americans is that they have, um, you know, some kind of inbuilt cultural propensity to believe in conspiracy theories. And the problem with that is means that they're just shooting themselves in the foot. They're always blaming others uh, when they need to kind of take responsibility for you know, an insert whatever kind of bugbear it is, you know, the, uh, the failure of the, the family, um, you know, the, the failure, unlike other minorities, to, to, to um, kind of rise up out of poverty and so on. And so, the, you know, there was a lot of discussion about this notion of, of black paranoia, which to me, you know, made no sense, um, was also kind of, you know, in effect, um, uh, essentialist um, racial nonsense. Instead, you know, the, the point was to think about um, the, the kind of historical reasons that made it make perfect sense for African Americans to to, to turn to conspiracy narratives. And there, you know, obviously Tus the Tuskegee syphilis studies and, but it's not just that, it is kind of, you know, long histories of institutional neglect, negligence, medical maltreatment, and, you know, um, the um, statistics uh, around um, incarceration and drugs policy and so on. And, you know, the argument I was making was exactly the one that you've been pointing to, which is, in effect, what we're talking about is institutionalized racism, that these are not just a series of um, contingent or accidental things that have just happened and there's no one to blame, there's no one planned it. And yet the problem is, how do you assert the alternative, which is to say, look, look there is something uh, to the idea of processes that have produced the situation that we're in today. Um, and um, I, the argument I was making, and it sounds like uh, this film might be doing something kind of similar, is that I think one of the creative forms of um, a conspiracy uh, culture is to endlessly kind of walk that fine line between, uh, on the one hand, saying these are kind of structural processes that can be described in sociological ways, and on the other hand, naming names, blaming individuals, and yet kind of neither fully endorsing one nor fully rejecting the other. And I've, I, you know, I find that kind of a kind of fascinating form of culture because it's, it's unsettling, the, particularly when it gets uh, enacted in films that always entice us to identify with heroes. They're structured through the stories of individuals and that that's the way we... Um, we, we, we understand uh, personal. Peter, can you hear me? Individual agency. Excuse me. I can Peter? hear you. Peter. Have you, have you lost me? We're having, we're, we're having trouble hearing you as if you have some communication problems. Um, How's your connection? How's your connectivity? It's, um, it's bad. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So sorry about that. Did, um, how much of that, how much of that did you get? Sonia? Kind of till, uh, neither endorsing one or... or okay. Two. Yeah. Yeah. So does that, uh, so Sonia, does that, you know, it doesn't necessarily kind of um, provide an ultimate answer, but does that, does that kind of I'm going to have to think uh, about, I'm going to have to think about these things. Uh, it, you know, it helps me think through it, uh, but I'm, I'm going to need some time to process this. So thank you. 
Okay, there's, a, there's another question in the chat box from someone who doesn't have a camera or a microphone. So that's uh, Nerav Grossman. Um, just as a general observation of its prevalence in today's social discourse, I've noticed lately the conspiracy theories are very popular on social media platforms like YouTube, uh, where people really dive into these theories and are conducting thorough research. Some even create full documentary style episodes, such as topping the trending charts. It really does make me question what it is that makes our society sit in them and what revives that interest in some time periods as opposed to others. Okay, yeah, so this is the um, one of the, the main reasons I've started to look at conspiracy theories again, because this is the thing that everyone's talking about certainly since the 2016 US election. Um, but more generally about social media platforms like YouTube um, and Facebook, they seem to, um, the very medium itself seems to entice people into a world of conspiracy thinking. This is the kind of what's called the rabbit hole hypothesis that um, particularly on YouTube, the recommendation algorithm leads people down the rabbit hole into ever more extreme um, uh, videos and that the medium becomes so all in again we lost the past the last few sentences but i might try going downstairs to be nearer the uh, the wi-fi router so uh, let me, let me just uh, take off the external microphone. Um, just a moment. Okay, so I'm going to um, head downstairs so you can see uh, the Very house good. we're renting in the Netherlands at the moment. And I will be um, fighting for Wi-Fi space with my, my daughter who has um, got her uh, Zoom class downstairs, but let's see. Can you close the doors? That's what okay, so um, is this connection better? Uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. Okay, so yeah. So the, um, the, 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 the thing that everyone's worrying about, um, particularly around YouTube, is that the medium itself um, pushes people into conspiracy theorizing. That it's um, that this is the the kind of the thing that everyone's been been worrying about. That there is something about social media that um, is taking those the floating voters or the kind of the silent um, majority in the middle, people who think I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but let me see what the recommendation algorithm provides, with the idea that um, the the logic of the social media platforms uh, the economic logic is to generate uh engagement and you generate engagement by generating kind of uh, ever more extreme content and if you couple this with the idea that social media platforms have no responsibility as publishers but they uh are merely kind of you know neutral platforms where anyone can say anything they like what we've been seeing certainly since 2016 but more particularly now in with the pandemic and uh with trump's um threat to try and kind of um uh stop twitter and other social media platforms having this this exemption as publishers we're now getting to these kind of clear battle lines of does you know does social media um push people towards forms of irrationality and um, uh, conspiracy thinking. You know, and I'm, 
I don't, my suspicion is sort of, but not in kind of, not in the way that everyone fears. Um, so that's, um, you know, that's the research I'm trying to do at the moment to try and work out, well, what effect does the medium have? Uh, is, uh, is the medium changing the very nature of conspiracy theories? Um, and obviously the question I'm always being asked these days is, well, and if so, what can we do about it? So, you know, I'd be curious to see what, 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 what you folk think, you know, is, uh, is the social media information ecosystem producing just, you know, a very different world that is pushing more and more people into conspiracy thinking? Um, maybe can I ask uh, a question? Yeah, sure. Um, the, you said uh, that a lot of the uh, rise of the conspiracy is also tied with the intellectual landscape that was created sort of by the fallout of post-modernism uh, with like no, no one truth. And it's sort of uh, reminding me that there was a similar like intellectual landscape in classical Greece where with the rise of sophistry, which basically led uh, to another crumbling of a democratic regime. So like the way that the thinkers and the writers and uh, uh, proto-academics uh, responded to that was with uh, an educational sort of revolution of establishing these sort of educational institutes that taught you how to sort of fight off um, all these stray theories and stray versions of truth and just sort of how to be able to respond to them yourself. So I wanted to ask um, if there is any uh, sort of like intellectual movement to rethink of how education is done, like in response to conspiracy. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really interesting uh, idea, a kind of parallel you're making there. Um, I'm... I'm skeptical about the idea that um, the alt-right has really truly embraced the idea of um, uh, anything goes, there are no foundational truths. Um, um, I, I recognize that there is indeed a widespread social mistrust of experts and expertise, but I think that quite often there is still a residual underlying faith in um, facts and arguments, even if um, the arguments that conspiracy theorists are making are often kind of self-contradictory, there is still somehow a residual faith that actually, uh, even if I don't believe your experts, I believe in the, the power of evidence. A lot of it is basically saying, um, I'm interpreting the evidence differently to the way that uh, the mainstream is has done. So I'm, although it looks like there is this kind of, and this is the Rosenblum and Muirhead argument that, oh my God, you know, there is a complete breakdown of um, uh, belief in objective truth and the ground rules of the game of reasoning and argument. Um, these conspiracy theorists will just kind of say anything and believe anything. I think that actually there is um, still both a residual faith in uh, rational argumentation. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, once again, contrary to what um, Rosenblum and Muirhead are argument, arguing, there's also still a sense of um, political utopia. The way they read it is to say that we're now living in a time of, in effect, complete nihilism, that the kind of conspiracy without theory is basically, is, is merely just uh, challenging everything, but without envisaging some better world. I, I don't think that reads true for most conspiracy uh, uh, culture that, that I see. You know, some of it, some of it is trolling from the alt-right just for the sheer um, uh, purposes of, you know, um, pissing everyone off. But I think a lot of the stuff, you know, particularly the thing, you know, if you think about the conspiracy theories we're seeing with the pandemic, yeah, you know, there's a lot of kind of 
kind of crazy alt-right stuff. But, you know, with QAnon, there is a kind of a, a religious passion behind it that often is tied with um, kind of anti-vaxxers. And, you know, and anti-vaxxers, they might be entirely misguided in factual terms, but there is something, you know, there are reasons why people uh, distrust the medical uh, establishment. They want to see a better form of um, uh, kind of medicine. There is a desire for something better. And so, um, although you know, the, the argument that's been made is that the alt-right is or rather kind of, you know, postmodernism has come to a grinding halt. The, the, rel the kind of relativism of postmodernism is no better than the kind of um, um, nihilism of the alt-right. I'm not entirely convinced that that's how um, large parts of contemporary conspiracy culture are working, even if it's probably the case for some parts of the alt-right. Thank you. Um, so just looking at another kind of comment in the chat bar, um, if anything, I would think that the information we have as a society, uh, the more information we have as a society, the less people believe conspiracy theories. And of course, you know, this, this was the promise of the internet. All, all information will be free and freely available to everyone. Finally, we will achieve the enlightenment um, utopian dream of, of complete rationality. The thing that's been preventing us in the past is that we just didn't have enough information. Well, we've got all the information that we could ever possibly need now, and lo and behold, uh, we haven't quite reached that utopia. So I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I get the idea that um, more information, and given that information better information is is freely available in theory that should mean that conspiracy theories dwindle and yet what we're observing is is the very opposite the more information that is available online the more people seem to believe in conspiracy theories and one thing that we do know is that um, false information travels more quickly and more widely than accurate information online you know, the, the lots of studies have been done of kind of uh, Twitter, for example, and Facebook. Um, can I ask a follow-up question on that? I'm just going to try. Yeah, sure. Um, um, I don't know how to say this, but do you see a difference uh, in the quality of conspiracy theories that are now, because when I, when I think to myself, I believe more the Illuminati mystery than other conspiracies that are today, even though there is more volume, I like, th this is what sticks. Like everybody knows the Illuminati. Everybody knows the Masons, but you know. So, um, so tell me, um, tell me what you believe about the Illuminati, because you know, the Illuminati comes in so many different, different versions. I'm just really curious, uh, um, what, what form your belief takes. It's not exactly something specific that I believe. It's just, it feels so ancient and mysterious. And in popular culture, it's displayed like this, that I think, um, I think, I think it's more credible. I know it's still conspiracy theory, but to me, it feels more real than other conspiracy yeah. theories. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, you know, the, uh, the Illuminati is just kind of an absolute kind of fascinating conspiracy theory. I mean, the way, the way, the version that we have now is not the kind of Illuminati scare of the 1790s. So the real Illuminati only existed for kind of, you know, a, uh, a decade or so in Bavaria. Um, they were kind of banned um, in the mid uh, 1780s. And then you get kind of fears in the 1790s in the US that somehow this kind of um, foreign conspiracy is, is arrived on the shores uh, uh, of the US. Um, the Illuminati myth then kind of lays dormant for, uh, um, for most of the 19th century, but gets revived um, on the back of um, the protocols of the elders of Zion 
uh, in the 1920s, um, particularly um, a British aristocrat called uh, Nestor Webster writes this kind of crazy series of books, um, in effect arguing that um, the Russian Revolution uh, was, it wasn't just that the French Revolution was caused by the Illuminati, it was the Russian Revolution. And so, you know, the Illuminati myth uh, of the 20th century gets tied in with, with, with anti-Semitism, and then it gets um, tied in with anti-communism in the 1950s, it gets revived by the John Birch Society. But the version of the Illuminati myth that, that you're tempted to actually comes about from a satirical series of novels in the 1960s called the Illuminatus Trilogy. So they took um, a series of kind of, you know, crazy ideas and they were spoofing um, um, popular conspiracy theories, and they turned it into this kind of um, absolutely mad novel. There's a guy called Robert Anton Wilson, who was uh, uh, an editor at Playboy. And what happened is that that spoof came to be taken as, as quite serious. Um, and so since then, the Illuminati myth that we know today that is backdated, not to 1776, when the real Illuminati were founded, but somehow mystically back into kind of, you know, ancient times involving kind of forms of mysticism. That, that version of the Illuminati myth, as I say, comes about from the spoof novel of the, the, uh, the, the 70s, um, and then gets worked into um, hip hop culture in, uh, in, in the in the 2000s and takes on a whole new life of its own. So the question, are conspiracy theories now less elaborate and in some ways less um, kind of meaningful and perhaps even less poetic, less religious, we might say, than kind of classics like uh, like the Illuminati? Part of the answer for me would be, uh, the more you know about the real history of the Illuminati, the more skeptical, oh, sorry, the more you know about the real history of the Illuminati myth, the more skeptical you might, you might be. Um, uh, um, but the argument that Muirhead and Rosenblum are making is that, yeah, you know, those good old fashioned conspiracy theorists, theories of the past, um, we don't have any more. We just have uh, Trump's tweets that are just a mere suggestion of something without the elaborate conspiracy um, explanation behind it. I think if you look at QAnon culture online, it is amazingly elaborate, insanely elaborate. You know, the way QAnon you know, it's basically alleging a deep state plot, but it's uh, the idea is that this character Q who is an anonymous uh, intelligence insider who has been dropping clues that are called breadcrumbs to what's really going on. Um, and the followers of Q obsessively, biblically interpret every kind of last tiny um, statement um, from Q. And this, this is why it's producing kind of, you know, QAnon is, is turning into uh, the second, second great awakening. So in that sense, I think there is something to Muirhead and Rosenblum's idea that a lot of conspiracy theories are now just mere passing suggestions without the kind of hard work underneath the footnotes and the kind of the elaborate myth making. And yet, actually, the more you delve into a lot of uh, online culture, the more it does resemble, perhaps even exceed um, uh, previous, previous eras of um, conspiracy culture. Trump's tweets might not do, but I think some of those four hour YouTube videos that I've sat through, um, they, they, they go into things in detail. We have time for one last uh, comment or question, if there is on anyone's part. 
Okay, so uh, in the absence of that, Peter, then I, I think I'll simply wrap things up uh, by once again thanking you for your uh, time and your insights. And we'll be busy, uh, we'll be busy inculcating all of this. <laughs> Try to make sense of our uh, increasingly complex reality and our sense of the loss of control. We didn't really talk too much about that. That also yeah, strikes yeah. me as kind of a function of what's going on. And those who have a stronger sense, a stronger a sense of losing control might find it more difficult, in fact, to find a place for complexity in their lives and thus are more desperate for a, a, a immediate a, a yeah. fast food form of, of, of uh, coherence. You know, the slogan, the dominating slogan of Brexit was take back control. There was no spe specificity of who might have the control or when we lost it, but it was just this rallying cry, take back uh -huh. control. But so the I loss think, of know, control yeah. is certainly no mm. fiction. It's a very real, a deeply a, a embedded in material reality on the part of uh, a huge segments of the population who ended up voting for Trump, I think, for those reasons. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. It was great seeing you. I'll actually, I'll write to you uh, <laughs> privately uh, on the mails. Okay. But uh, thank you everyone for your questions and comments um, and uh, enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.